You're listening to the Good Food CFO Podcast, where we focus on financial strategies for building a profitable food business. I'm your host, Sarah Delavan. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Luisa Alberto. She is the CEO of People First Finance, a virtual CFO agency that provides bookkeeping, tax planning, and financial strategy services to women business owners. Luisa has 18 years of finance and operations experience, working alongside visionary leaders of successful Bay Area startups, and earned her first entrepreneurial stripes as owner and operator of a boutique made-to-order juice bar in San Francisco. Her mission these days is to ease the financial burden and overwhelm that holds too many talented, self-employed women back from reaching their full potential and making a successful living as the brilliant creators they were born to be. I am so excited to welcome Louisa to the podcast to talk about her entrepreneurial financial journey. She's sharing how the way she signed up for business debt in her first business led to filing for bankruptcy, how and why it did not deter her from the entrepreneurial life, and the lessons she learned about risk and how business owners can approach it. We have so much to talk about, so let's get to it. Hey, Louisa, I am so glad you're here today. Thanks so much for joining me. I am so stoked to be here, Sarah. I I have to say, I love the fact that like we sort of share, there are a lot of similarities in our journeys to financial entrepreneurship or, or becoming CFOs for uh, other food business owners. And I want to sort of like talk about that a little bit. So you and I both owned food businesses at one point. Can you share a little bit about your food business, maybe how long you were doing it and sort of, you know, the down and dirty without getting into too much details, like how long did it last and how did it feel kind of heading out of it? Totally. Well, I think for a lot of people, starting a food business is a labor of love um, and often just comes from the joy that we feel when we eat really good food or are a part of the food community, um, especially in California and Northern California. The food community here is so strong, especially food and beverage. And so that's my background um, is I work with food and beverage companies. I work with Blue Bottle Coffee and built their wholesale program. And through that really got to know a lot of the most incredible restaurants, not only in the Bay Area, but across the U.S. And I was just so inspired by the by a high dedication to craft when it came to food. And so Essentially, uh, my business partner and I decided to start a boutique juice shop because at the time, everybody was opening cafes and coffee shops, and we were just so enamored with how beautiful and diverse and incredible um, produce is in Northern California, honestly. And I know that we share this very specific (laughs) love. Um, But so we just thought, how cool would it be to open a juice bar where we are highlighting seasonality, where what we offer changes, um, you know, with the seasons. And so we were using really incredible ingredients like Buddha sand citron and persimmon and pomegranate and things that you don't really see a lot in juice form. And just loved it. So it definitely came from that place. Um, But when you start a labor of love, oftentimes what that leads to is learning a lot of really hard business lessons, money lessons. Um, You're an employer all of a sudden. And it just, that part of the game really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, And yeah, I just learned a lot from going down that path, but that's how it started. Yeah. So the similarities in case you haven't listened to the very first episode of of the Good Food CFO podcast are wild. Like also had a business partner, also had a very boutique business. We were a pop-up market featuring all of the best produce and even like locally raised um, proteins and dairy and and obviously wild-caught seafood from the area. And it was totally a labor of love. It was driven by passion. And for us, and I don't know if this was the case for you, but I know that so many other food business owners share this. It was like, it's okay if we don't make a ton of money. It's okay if we're not millionaires or, you know, if like if we'll barely pay ourselves because we're doing good in the world, right? And then like two years in, you're just completely exhausted. I had like permanent bags under my eyes. Um, and, you know, in order to make it work, the business would have had to look really different. And neither of us were passionate about that version of a business, right? So that's why we decided to close ours. But so many hard-learned lessons, many of them centered around financials um, that sort of, you know, led us to to where we are today. So 
what I'm super excited about talking about with you today in particular, and I mentioned this in the intro, is bankruptcy. And number one, I love talking about things that nobody else is talking about. And I don't know anybody else who's talking about bankruptcy. So thank you for agreeing or offering, I should say, to, to come on to the show and, and talk about this. I think you're going to help a lot of people. I think you're going to help remove a lot of stigma around that word. And I'm super excited to, to get into that. So let's just jump right in, if that's okay with you, and talk about why did you take on debt um, in your business and how did you take on that debt? Ooh, I love that. Yeah. So I took on debt quite frankly, because that's what I was used to. Um, there was no other way to do it in my mind. And I was young. Um, I was taking a risk. And so, you know, what we did actually to first start uh, the the juice, it was, this, we started as a pop-up essentially. So what we first did was we started a Kickstarter project. So okay. we got some money, right? So I was like, okay, I don't really want to take on debt. So let's see if I can raise some funds from, you know, friends and family. So we did that. But you get to a point where that's not going to sustain the business. And so at that point where we were able to invest in infrastructure to set up at the farmer's market, which was we went from a pop-up inside a wine bar, a friend's wine bar, to sort of test the concept. Then we went into the farmer's market. And to set up at a farmer's market, I mean, you've got to spend money. You've got to spend money on the setup, on the equipment, everything's outside. So you have to weatherproof. We had to get fridges. We had to keep everything cold. Um, you know, we had to make sure we had, uh, you know, floor mats. I mean, all the little details and those things add up. But it was this yeah. opportunity, this wonderful opportunity to do what we loved, to do it at the San Francisco Ferry Building, which is like foodie mecca. Um, and that's really why we started doing what we were doing. So it was like a no brainer. It was like, of course, I'm going to take this risk. Of course, I'm going to take on credit card debt. And we're going to set this up. And it's going to be great. It's going to everybody's going to love it. And we're going to be busy all the time. And we're going to make all this money. And it'll be totally fine. Um, and so I sort of went into it thinking that way. But I was always really good at, you know, tracking our transactions and being very methodical. I have a background in ops and finance. So I was always like, I kept books from day one. I knew that that was really important, but I was bringing with me this personal idea that debt was okay. And not only that it was okay, it was necessary. And what I realized now is that though I took on that debt, I, I did not have a plan for profit. I did, I wasn't really looking at my numbers and the way that I've learned now is so powerful where you really have to be able to say, okay, I'm going to absorb this, I'm going to take all this debt. And what is my plan to not only cover these monthly payments that I have, right? Because we can say, oh, we'll just, we'll just throw this as, you know, every month I've got to pay, you know, $500. I can totally do that, you know, for right. the next four years, you know? So <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that that I didn't consider because I was just so excited to be able to finally do what I loved in the place where I really wanted to do it. So we took on that debt. Of course, in the beginning, we didn't pay ourselves. I didn't pay myself anything. Um, so I was also living on personal credit card debt, which so many business owners do, right? Because you're like, well, I've got to get by. I've got to use the cash I have for things that I can only pay cash for, like rent. Like we're getting real here. Like this yeah, is a real yeah. scenario. Um, yeah. But you're so in love with what you're doing. And you believe, like this is the thing about it. You believe so full heartedly that it's going to work and that there's no way it can't and that you wanted to, you're going to want to do it forever and wake up every Saturday at 6 a.m. and set up the tent like you just think that all of this is is the way and the thing and yeah. it's just so funny because looking back on it now I'm like what a beautiful place to be coming from and it got me in so much trouble because I didn't have that plan for profit and I didn't know what I didn't know quite honestly um but I had accepted debt as, you know, part of, part of, part of my world. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to dig into that a little bit, this idea of debt as being good or bad and just sort of, you know, the space that I come from and, and what I like to talk about with our clients and program members is there's no such thing as good or bad debt. And I think going back to something that you just said is if you're going to take on debt, have a plan for it. And when I am talking about debt and I'm, and I think that you would agree with this, we're talking like it, it's okay to use credit cards to fund business if you have a plan. Right. And, and I view that as you investing in yourself and investing in your own business. If you take outside money right? That you have to repay. That's another form of debt. And you should also have a plan for repaying that debt as well. So when we're thinking about debt 
you're talking about it specifically in terms of credit cards right now, but I want people to be thinking about it in like all the ways that debt can be taken on and just putting a pin in the importance of having a plan, not just to pay it back and like not be able to afford paying yourself or growing your business or anything like that. But what is the, what is the role it plays in your business and, and what are the long-term and short-term effects of having to repay that, that debt? So well, and also understanding the risk, and I know that this is something that we'll get to yeah. in more detail, but but when you take on debt, yes, taking on debt is a tool. Using and leveraging credit is a tool. Absolutely. I could talk about a million different ways where and scenarios where leveraging debt is really how businesses are built. I mean, that's what yeah. we do. That's how this system is set up. So yeah, I don't want to deter anyone from it. And it's really, really important to understand that that is always a risk. That if you mm -hmm. don't have the total amount that you're on the hook for sitting somewhere, earning interest, ready to just be paid back at the drop of a hat, you are assuming risk in that scenario as well. So when you decided to take on debt, you used a credit card. And was this a personal credit card or was this a business credit card? And can you talk a little bit about the structure of your business and if that played a role in sort of the rest of the story. Yeah. So this is so important. And any opportunity I get to talk about this, I just hope that it, that someone hears it and takes my mistake and really can learn from it um, moving forward. So when we started, it was a, my partner and I, um, and we incorporated as a, an LLC, a limited liability company as a partnership. And we each had 50, 50 ownership of the business. Um, so when we took on the, um, when we went to essentially what we did was we set up the LLC and then we went to Chase. We went to Chase Bank and said, okay, we have this business. We want to take out a loan of credit to be able to, you know, a line of credit to be able to invest in the equipment that we needed to set up our shop. And so I had stellar credit because I have always been like a rule follower and I've always paid my, you know, payments back. And so they extended us a fairly big line of credit. <clears throat> so I open this line of credit through my business. I say, here's my LLC. Here's my EIN number that's related to my LLC. Um, and I, in that, in, in signing up for the debt that we took on, I really did believe that I was protected by my LLC, by my, by setting up an LL, you know, a limited liability um, company. I had a business partner. I felt legit. I was going to this big bank. I was saying, this is for a business reason. And I was like, cool, now we're, we're doing this thing. Yeah. Um, so we took that on and, you know, when you do that, like when you open any account, you're presented with a bunch of paperwork. Maybe it's just an electronic signature that you provide, um, but you are signing something and you are signing to the terms of that debt in case of a default, um, all of the payment terms, everything. And how often are we sitting mm -hmm. there in that moment? reading the fine print. How often are we sitting there asking ourselves, what happens if I can't pay this back? And I didn't ask those questions because I am a stubborn, hell-bent entrepreneur who is like, I'm going to take this debt. I'm going to turn it into a million dollars, you know, by running yeah. my amazing juice company. And so I was not in that frame of mind. Um, and so we took on that debt. Then we had an opportunity actually through the ferry building to open a kiosk that was going to be a permanent kiosk in the front of the ferry building. Another big opportunity. Now, at that point, were we profitable? No. Did I think this is going to be the thing that's going to, you know, turn the table and make us profitable? Yes. And so I assumed the risk and went forward with an SBA loan. So on top of the Chase credit card um, debt that we were using that line of credit to be able to afford essentially operating expenses, um, you know, and what we needed to run the markets and run our current operation, I took on, you know, also signed up for an SBA loan. Again, my partner and I were 50-50 owners of the business. We had set up an LLC. We were presented with a bunch of paperwork again, SBA loan documents, reading through everything. You know, I did the best I could. I really thought I understand what I'm signing up for. I was able to ask questions, had great support. Um, so went through that process and essentially was able to fund our business and operations for a few months, for maybe six months or so. Um, but then with any business, there's going to be some 
you know, at some point, probably a, a macroeconomic effect. COVID is, you know, a good example of that. But for us, yeah. it was seasonality. And I hadn't really considered the effect of seasonality on the business. Um, we were booming in, you know, warm months when it was dry, but when it was a rainy month and, you know, there wasn't a lot of foot traffic at the ferry building, things changed and the situation mm-hmm. became really um, dire. Um, and so, but that's how we were funding everything was through these lines of credits of credit right. that we had signed up for as, as, as a company, as a business. Right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. And so how long were you in business for? So we opened in 2012 and we closed in 2019. So almost six years. Oh, wow. Okay. So you are in the ferry building, you are running your business. You are, do you ever become profitable? No, we never okay. become profitable and I do not pay myself. So this is okay. all like, we're just setting everything up for design. I also took on, so in addition to that, um, I was working with a mentor at the time, an advisor who really believed in our business plan and was supporting us through um, the growth of our business and um, became an investor in the business as well, uh, okay. but did not take any equity or ownership for that. So it was, you know, um, another loan, another line of credit that we were on the hook to pay back. Okay. So you, for I'm sure a variety of reasons, it's never an easy decision to close your business. The business closes and my assumption is, but kind of round out the story for me that you've got bills that haven't been paid. You've got debt that is still owed. Can you give us a little bit, um, kind of fill us in on the scenario, sort of what did it look like upon closure? We freaked out. Mm. I mean, we're good people. We wanted to be able to pay our creditors back. We wanted to be able to build a business that was sustainable. We had the best of intentions. Um, And I think that's what really stung the most is that so much of what we were doing came from a place of love and of belief in what we were doing. Um, And so the emotional side of closing a business, of realizing that what you thought was going to be this magical, you know, successful experience, just everything just crumbled. And so there's this emotional, and, and on top of that, one of the sort of, you know, nails in the coffin, I guess you could say, is I was also um, pregnant at the time and had my daughter right when we opened the kiosk um, at the ferry building. So throw that, let's just throw that as icing on top that I became a new mother and was going through that experience in my personal life. So, you know, needless to say, emotionally, it was really challenging. Um, And what we did and what we had done throughout, you know, from day one in growing our business is we reached out to mentors and advisors who could help us understand, you know, what are we on the hook for here? We had to break our lease Um, and so we had been having conversations, um, you know, about like what was working, what wasn't about the, the space. And, um, we had to break our lease. We had to break a lot of these commitments that felt really, um, important and scary. Um, and it was the first time we had ever done that. And, you know, we're these people again with these good intentions thinking like, oh my gosh, we don't want to disappoint anybody and we don't want to do anything wrong or get in trouble. You know, that kind of mentality. You want to be good and do good. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, and so just coming to the reality that we couldn't, that there was no way either of us, I mean, we had both put in so much and gotten so little monetarily, you know, from a resource standpoint back. Yeah. Um, and so, and closing down and figuring out how to liquidate, you know, all of our equipment and firing employees. And I mean, the list goes on. Oh, that hurts. Yeah. So it yeah. felt really, really um, heavy. Um, but what we did was, again, we turned to advisors. We were actually connected with a, um, I, I believe she was a lawyer, but she was somebody who um, sort of specialized in the dissolution of businesses. Um, and she sort of coached us through the process by asking us a lot of different questions about, you know, because though this chapter was closing, we had to decide also, do we dissolve our partnership? Or do we do something different together? Is there another way that we can pivot the business um, to be able to keep going? Um, And this is where you had talked about too before, like sort of that, you know, like, do do we want to do this differently to be able to make it more profitable? Um, You know, I don't know. We were both sort of spent at that point. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so that was a really tough, um, tough part of the road. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I can relate. I mean, you feel like, you are number one, you're letting down your customers and, you know, 
our position was that we had regular weekly shoppers that we saw every single week who would come to us and say, you've got us cooking. You've got us in the kitchen. Like, we don't know what we would do without you. And in the back of our minds, we're like, oh my God, we're going to be, we're, we're closing. Like we can't, you know, and, and we tried the different ways and yeah, it's crushing on so many levels. You are, you feel like you're letting down your community. And in some cases you are, that's the like really hard, honest truth about it. And, you know, you are, we didn't have to break any leases, thankfully, but we were essentially a pop-up the entire time. I'm thankful that we didn't take on a lease anywhere. Um, It never really felt right for us. And I think maybe in our guts, we knew like this probably isn't the right move for us. And so in that sense, it was a bit easier, but um, we too had credit card debt um, at the end of our business. And I think we were paying ourselves like a hundred dollars a week and then like leftover groceries. So that was our monetary take. And we had employees, you know, part-time team members who thankfully we were able to pay. I know that that also is not the case for every small business, but we were able to pay them until their last days and we were able to give them notice and that felt good. Um, But we too had a chunk of debt that needed to be paid off. And I'll share that my business partner's family was able to help us pay that off in one lump sum. It wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't too much. It wasn't too overbearing for us. And I was on a payment plan. And so I payment planned my business partner for, I think it was like, I don't know, three years or something. I've sort of like put it out of my mind um, <laughs> until that debt was gone. And so I, lucky for me, I was offered a job, a full-time job that I really loved and that furthered my career in food, which I'm so grateful for that job, but also like it was really hard to say, well, some of this money that I'm making now is is going toward paying, sort of paying off that business adventure. But I will say this too, and I know you're going to share sort of the outcomes of, of your experience, but I don't regret it. You know, yes, my financials may have looked different for a while, but also so would my career. And for that, I am just endlessly, endlessly thankful. Um, so in your story... You've taken on debt. You've taken investment that you have to pay back. You've you've got credit card debt. You've got SBA loan debt, perhaps that also needs to be paid back. You're getting advised on how to go about closing the business, which isn't so easy as just saying, okay, we're done doing business. There's a lot of paperwork that the government needs to have and all sorts of things. Because if you don't do that right, which we didn't, you have an $800 like LLC bill that comes for a business that you're not even operating anymore. Um, so that's fun, which we didn't have to pay, thank goodness. Um, but, but yeah, so financially, what are you learning and realizing at this point? So luckily, Or maybe even because I had had to live on so little for so long and be very frugal. I had been on my own personal um, journey in personal finance and understanding sort of the ins and outs of that and how I can manage my money better and how to think about risk and how to think about budgeting. And so I had already been on that journey. And through that journey, I was sort of at this crossroads now where it was like, okay. And like you said, it's like, okay great solution, right? Somebody pays back the creditors and then you're able to sort of cut ties there and work out privately how that's going to resolve itself, right? I love that. That's a great option to get, you know, yourself out of that debacle. For us, I had this partnership that was going all wrong. Didn't feel good anymore. Didn't feel right anymore. And we were both tied to this this liability and this thing that was going to hold us back for years. And I was at this point where I was just ready to be free. I was ready to learn these lessons, though I had learned them the hard way. My career trajectory, similar to you, Sarah, would not have been the same had I not learned the ins and outs of some of these really horrible things, (laughs) you know, Um, and systems and decisions. And so, um, I, we went back and forth. We had lots of conversations about it. You know, we could do this, we could do that. Well, how would that feel? And what about that? And I was like, I have a daughter. I have a daughter. I've learned so much on my personal finance journey. I've learned so much in business. I want to be able to take everything that I've learned and monetize it. I want to be able to take everything I've learned Mm -hmm. and make something out of it. And I don't want to carry this monkey on my back, this burden, this payment, this reminder of how hard everything that we went through was, I want it gone. I want it gone. I choose to have it be gone. (laughs) Yeah. Can I circle back a little bit and say, you know, you talked about when you were signing up for the debt, 
you know, the paperwork and some things that you were kind of hinting to at, at maybe you missed a detail or something in the fine print. Can you shed some light on why as an LLC, even though you were closing the LLC, why was it that you and your partner, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, were both personally personally liable um, for the Yeah. Debt? So that's such a great question. Um, so what I didn't realize or what I thought was you form an LLC limited liability company, right? That must mean that it limits my liability in all ways. I mean, I didn't know. I didn't, you know, you don't read the fine print again. You're just so excited to do the thing. Um, And so um, I had assumed incorrectly that that meant that that debt was taken on by the business. Mm -hmm. Until I learned that there was something called, uh, or that we had signed up Uh, for the debt as personal guarantors, which meant that we each were personally liable for all of the debt that we had signed up for, even though our official business entity was a limited liability company. And this is really important because every, um, you know, contract you sign for debt, depending on the lender, it's going to be different, right? Um, And it took me making lots of different phone calls and tracking down lots of documentation to confirm that this was actually a legal truth, um, you know, with the the type of debt that we had taken on. Um, And I actually found out because I was, I went to the Apple store and I was trying to get, I think a laptop or something. And I remember I told you I had stellar credit and I had tried to purchase it with a credit card I had and it got denied. And they were like, we can't process this. And I was like, what? but I have credit available and they had frozen my accounts because we had defaulted on these loans that I didn't wow. realize were showing up on my personal credit report. And so the credit authorities had been alerted that these loans were in default. Meanwhile, I'm thinking I have an LLC, I'm protected. I'm taking the time to yeah. make the best decision I can about how I'm going to treat this debt, whether I will declare bankruptcy or not. Um, and in that time I got pushed into making a decision much faster because it was affecting my personal um, purchasing yeah. ability this way. And I want to make a note too that this personal guarantee is not just in relation to like large debts or lines of credit that you're taking on. But as the food business owners who are listening, if you go to work with a distributor who is going, you're purchasing your ingredients from pay attention to the fine print 10 out of 10 times, you're personally guaranteeing anything that they, any, any credit that they extend to you, whether it's 10 days, right? Net 10 on your invoices, net 30. If your business closes, you are, you're liable for making those payments. So this truth, this very, very big, very important truth about an LLC not protecting you is big. It's important. And I'm so glad that you're here talking about it. And it's just another, you know, something to shine a light on, right? Like being really clear on what you are signing up for. And as hard as it is not looking at everything with rose colored glasses, when you're an excited, passionate entrepreneur, you know, totally. and, and I'll share this too on my side. And, you know, you shared that you were having a, a daughter and I'm, I'm totally a risk taker. Like we'll figure it out. We'll work it out. Even if it all goes wrong, I can find a way. My husband is not the same. He's like, I like to have money in the bank. I like to feel good and safe in that regard. Right. So we have very different approaches to finances that way. And it never really mattered. It was never like a, a, a thing in our relationship until I was really taking a lot of risk. And, and that was something that I kind of had to learn the hard way too. It's like, you know, so that's important. And I think, and I'm just sharing that because when you sign these agreements, when you personally guarantee something, it's you and your partner, if you have one in life, right? Like, like, that you're financially connected with. And I think that's an important thing to also point out and be real about. It is. And, and people don't talk about it enough. And I think that what I found and why I'm so comfortable sharing this is because I was able to sort of navigate to find, to find the confidence that I needed to make this decision from a place of empowerment. And what's really important about that. And we can talk about this as we get into risk as well, but this is part of business. Bankruptcy is a very normal 
part of business. Do people abuse this? All the time. All yeah. the time, right? So there's no way I'm promoting this. Like I will talk to somebody about a million other options before I think that bankruptcy is the right thing. Oftentimes people feel like, oh my gosh, bankruptcy is my only option. And you actually look at their finances and you're like, no, it may feel like that. It may feel like the best thing to do or the only thing to do is to just like call it. Yeah. However, you can usually navigate your way through that, even if it's hard and feels arduous. But for me, I was just so clear that this is the line in the sand that I needed, not only for monetary reasons, but just for like in my life, for where I wanted to go, for where I was yeah. going, for where I am now. It was the right answer. I like have zero regrets. And, uh, and again, I will say, because a lot of small business owners and solo entrepreneurs and people who you know, they're in riskier or more precarious situations, don't think about something like bankruptcy as a tool. And I will say that it exists for a reason and that businesses in many different situations use this as a tool. Um, and so it's not something to be afraid of. It's something to learn about and understand. So you make the decision, which sounds like it was financial, emotional, personal, it was all of the things. Um, you decide that bankruptcy is the right thing for you to do. What does it look like? Um, can you shed a little bit of light on like the process or how long it takes? And then what, what happens to your, to your finances after that? Like, can you never get a line of credit again? Truth us on all of this. Like yes. tell us the real deal. <laughs> yeah. So I found a bankruptcy attorney. And so this is something that I recommend to anyone who's even considering bankruptcy is get your facts, get your facts mm. and get someone who is a professional who does this all the time because bankruptcy attorneys, they're just, this is what they do every single day. Um, I found somebody who literally was just like, okay, here's, you know, 20 questions. Let me ask them all. It was like a, a mill, right. you know, of just like, right. oh yeah. Okay. See this. There's a way that this works. Um, but I was able to ask a lot of questions and get some, some um, alternative perspective on whether or not it was actually a viable option because there are complications depending on what assets you own, um, what your income looks like. There are a lot of dependencies that you need to speak with a professional about to understand whether it's even an option for you. Um, and then there are a couple of different types of bankruptcy. There's chapter seven and um, chapter 10. Um, and so there are stipulations around those, again, depending on whether you, you know, have a car, for example, or so there, so there are different, um, you know, obviously for each individual's, uh, particular situation, there's going, there are going to be different options available to you, but speaking with a bankruptcy attorney is going to really help you understand the ins and outs of that. Um, and the process is really submitting a lot of information, um, having it filed, um, as soon as the, you know, your application is filed, your creditors are alerted so they cannot send you any more notices or contact right. you to get payment. Um, and you essentially wait for your turn in court. Um, and they'll, you know, ask you a few questions and, you know, give you a, a file, you know, let you know whether or not you've been approved for that filing. Um, you have to take a course, you know, to learn about how to not declare bankruptcy again. Um, so it's a very, it's like a very, it's a very legal legalized, like, you know, check the boxes kind of process really at the end of the day. Um, but again, it will depend on your personal situation, sort of what, you know, what that really looks like. But um, so went through that and, um, you know, essentially came out of it feeling like, wow, that's all done. Like I can actually draw a line in the sand and, um, you know, one really big reason why I did that as well is because I understand how hard it is to carry overhead month over month as a business mm -hmm. owner and just in my personal life, how, what a burden it is to carry um, that kind of overhead. And so yeah. having that gone freed me up to do things like invest in a new business idea, um, you know, set up a cash cushion for myself. And what becomes really important after you declare bankruptcy is making sure you do have access to cash, whether that is having a cash reserve yourself or building that up um, and or, you know, there are also credit cards that you can apply for, um, secured credit cards that you can apply for where you put some money towards the credit card of your own and then you draw down from that balance and that helps to build your credit. Um, you can build your credit up fairly quickly. However, um, bankruptcy does stay on your credit report. It does affect 
um, lenders, you know, decisions to lend to you for at least seven or like seven to 10 years, really. Um, and mm. so it is something that you need to be prepared for. And had I not been on my personal finance journey, understanding how to put myself in a really solid personal financial position, I may not have been yeah. so inclined to go with bankruptcy because I knew that it would impact my ability to, you know, leverage credit if I really needed to for any emergencies, for example. Yeah. What's crossing my mind right now is, you know, you having been on your personal finance journey likely meant living below your means, right? Saving some of your money, really making those big, hard lifestyle decisions in order to live comfortably, so to speak, after the credit sort of capabilities go away right? Like when you can't take your credit card to the Mac store to get a new laptop and you have to use cash or you have to put that cash up to use that secured card, things, they get a little bit, they get a little bit different. And I think it's really, you know, we teach even to business owners who are using credit in their businesses, like we focus on how far will your money get you, your cash get you, right? And and getting to the place where you can have credit cards, right? And there is a time and a place and a benefit to having them. But like, let's, let's get as cash-based as we possibly can and then get really intentional with that credit. And I love that you're smiling, right? It's like, <laughs> that's probably where you were and where you had arrived when you after you filed. Yeah, I mean- dur- During the process. The thing about <clears throat> bankruptcy, is that it does not affect your earning potential. And that was key for me. This thing will affect my ability to borrow, but it will not affect my earning potential. What I wanted to protect was my earning potential. So now of all these lessons that I've learned, I'm going to leverage to monetize. You know, I hustled, I hustled to get cash. But I know yeah. how to hustle. I used my wake up at the six, you know, six in the morning, set up the farmer's yeah. market tent energy and my skills and everything that I built and learned as a business owner over the past six years. I did side, you know, side work as a bookkeeper. I took out, I did personal assistance work. I had a part-time job. I like I I did a lot of different things to increase the cash that was coming into my world before I started my own business again because I needed a break from you know for a moment to just sort of like let me rely on a paycheck for a little while and do these odd jobs and get some cash in before I go and take another you know risk in my professional life um but that's a really important consideration is that it didn't affect my earning potential that's one of my strongest attributes. And one of the things that makes me me is I can earn money. And so I didn't want that money, you know, going to a past mistake for, you know, the next five years, I really wanted to double down on my ability to generate revenue. I love that. So what are, what, what were you feeling once the time came to potentially step back into entrepreneur life? What things did you bring specifically to that decision, if any, from your experience with bankruptcy? And how do you or did you or do you continue to look at risk? Um, I would say personally and and professionally, um, because I'm sure like the two are not completely separate, right? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think I learned about this idea of carrying overhead, of carrying operating expenses, of carrying high costs, and really wanted a business that was lean, that was agile, that was flexible. Um, And so, you know, one-to-one finance coaching and consulting was a very natural fit for me. One, because I loved doing it. Two, because I had learned all of these awesome lessons that I wanted to share with others so that they weren't making the same mistakes. Um, And then in 2020, I decided to pivot my entire business. It was mostly Bay Area and I was traveling to people's homes and that kind of thing. And I decided to pivot online. Well, what a great, you know, possibility (laughs) and what a great moment in time to say, yeah, you know, this thing that I've been doing, like, and and I, I, I very much wanted to keep, like I say, an operation, like a business lean and mean after Mm -hmm. experiencing what I had experienced. Now, now I have team members, I've made investments, like I carry more overhead in my business, of course, but I I don't do it lightly. And when I'm Mm -hmm. also consulting with and working with my clients, 
overhead expenses are a conversation because it really can cripple a business. It really can, yeah. you know, the wrong expense at the wrong time over a period of months or years really can have a huge impact on cash flow in the business. Yeah. And so I think I'm just way more aware of that and sensitive to that piece of the of the bigger equation. So when you approach risk today in your business and, and perhaps when you're coaching your clients as well, do you have like a thought process or like a, like a mini checklist that you run through in your head or anything like that? Um, that you might share with us? Yeah. I mean, I think there comes a time in a business where, and this has happened for some of the clients that I've worked with, where you go from revenue generating, can I afford X, Y, or Z mode to how do I protect the asset that I've built? Mm. How do I mitigate risk for the asset that I'm building or that I've built? Um, and, you know, a very tangible, concrete way that I look at that or an example is in um, like lease terms or in, you know, purchasing terms. Yeah. You know, it may not be that you're a personal guarantor, you know, for a lease. Maybe you are. But until you read the fine print on that document and know exactly what you're signed up for and have that in front of you, um, you are in a, you know, high risk position. And a lot of yeah you know, businesses that have experienced success and maybe they haven't had the, you know, learned the hard lessons or thought about that side of the equation are still just in happy growth mode or can I afford that mode? And you really at some point in the trajectory of your business have to switch from can I afford it to how do I protect it? What are the contracts I'm obligated to? Like if I were to close everything tomorrow, what would that mm -hmm. look like? What would that mean? What would I need to consider? What's my balance sheet look like? Have I, you know, is all of my inventory up to date? Like, what does that all look like? Um, and, and I think I, there's a little, it's a little bit sad, but also like natural that the naiv naivety that I went into business, you know, the first time around has sort of been, you know, sanded down to this place of realism to, to think about those things in a different way. Um, yeah. And so that's something that I want to offer, you know, listeners is to really think about, okay, you've built something, if you're generating revenue, if you've got a profitable business, and or even if you're just in business, you're in it, you're committed, you have commitments, whether it's, you know, a lease commitment, or, you know, purchasing commitments, and those sorts of things, like you're in it. So you really yeah. do need to start thinking about how do I protect myself? How do I protect what I've built? Um, and, and we need to just start asking ourselves that on a much more regular basis, I think that we that we do. Yeah. I sometimes say to my clients that I'm the worst case scenario presenter. You know, <laughs> they come to me and they say, okay, we're thinking about investing in this thing. I'm like, all right, I can tell you're excited about it. And that is awesome. Here are all of the bad things that I think you should think about. What <laughs> if you get sick? What if, you know, what if all the bad things, and there's a book that I cannot remember the name of off the top of my head. I'll put, I'll put it in the show notes. And I talk about this on, on the blog as well, but it's like, when you're thinking about making, spending money, making an investment, taking on risk. Think about all the good things, like all the reasons why it's a good idea. And then think about all the many bad, like things that could happen as a result of it. And the author actually says like, find a friend who's not emotionally invested in your business and, and have them give you some ideas for all the bad things. And that's my role often for my, for my clients and my coaching members is, and it's not to talk anybody out of it, but it's to take a real hard look at what could happen. And, you know, I think people are really getting tired of us mentioning COVID, right. And, and what happened in 2020 and how many businesses were hurt by it, but it's just such a major thing, obviously, that has happened in our lives. And so many businesses who, for example, didn't have a cash reserve or who were carrying a lot of overhead or whatever, and they didn't have a plan, they didn't have an emergency fund. Sadly, for us and for them, their businesses had to come to a close or had to cease operations. And I think we can avoid that. And unfortunately, it took a really big lesson, but you and I know that, that big lessons like that are actually good things in, in hindsight. So, um, but yeah, I love that. I love getting real. Well, and that's why we're, that's why we're CFOs. I mean, we are the yeah. friend you call, right? <laughs> that's why we are in the positions we're in is because not only because we've been through all of this, but because we understand the numbers behind 
what sets yeah. the stage for these kinds of calamities. We've seen it. We've experienced it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Any other like words of wisdom or advice for someone listening who, I don't know, maybe they've taken on risk recently. Maybe they're listening to this and they're thinking, hmm, that like I could be Sarah or Louisa and maybe I don't want my current business to end that way or, you know, any, any little nuggets of wisdom you might want to share before we sign off today. Yeah. I mean, I think it is, I think taking on risk requires exactly what you were talking about, sort of the what ifs, right? To just pose the question, what if, what if this, what if that, what if, you know, the what ifs to really think through that, not think through it in like a, um, you know, only like a, a, you know, it would be so sad if this happened way, but what if you decided that you didn't want to live in this city anymore? What if you decided that you really wanted to purchase property in Tahiti? What if you, you know, like, what if all of a sudden you really wanted to follow this other dream? Like, it can be those questions, and they're still very relevant to how you look at the risk that you are taking on. The other bit of of, a tidbit is things are negotiable. Terms Mm, are negotiable. So even if you are signed up to something and you think, oh, my gosh, what have I done? It, there is always the possibility to go back to, you know, if, if you have a landlord or somebody who have a lease with or you've signed an agreement with and to say, hey, I know we, we signed up to these terms. Um, I really want to make this work. Things have shifted. Can we come to a different set of terms? And just yeah. asking, it, you know, it's no skin off your back. What's the worst thing that could happen? They say, no, you're left with the contract you've signed with. But it's always worth, worth asking because oftentimes things are more negotiable than we think. I love that. I think that that's amazing advice. Well, as I always say to all my guests, because I love all of you so much, I could talk forever about this. I think this is a topic that I hope our listeners get a lot of benefit from, a conversation that they benefit from. I know I've enjoyed it and and I'm, I'm super excited that we've had this conversation. I'd love to have you in our community, maybe to answer some questions about you know, risk and debt, um, and just kind of share your experience perhaps in some more detail. So, um, as this episode airs, we'll, we'll, um, talk about that and post some dates if they work out. So Louisa, thank you so much for your time and so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. For those folks who might want to follow you and get some words of wisdom and and information from you on social media or other types of platforms, where can they find you? I am all over that Instagram, as so many of us are. Um, So you can find me at People First Finance, and my website is also peoplefirstfinance.com. Amazing. Thank you so much, Louisa. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Sarah.